what, General? You can stay here with us tonight if you want to. No, no. You have done too much already. Okay. <laughs> Long ago, a group of musicians came to Israel from Egypt. You probably didn't hear about it. It wasn't very important. <laughs> Ariel Stachel. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, um, I'm sorry, I, I almost mispronounced your name. The big lesson of the band's visit is that a very minor mispronunciation can make a big difference in someone's life. That's right, and so, I'm responsible for that. Yeah. I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but... Uh. <laughs> it's, it's funny because this show is opening on Broadway in two days, uh, and I want to make sure we don't spoil it mm -hmm. for people who haven't seen it okay. yet, but I also want to make sure that we dig into what it's all about, so sure. we're going to walk that line sure, a sure, little sure. bit. Um, can you, in a couple of sentences, explain the premise without giving away like the major plot points? Sure. So, um, hello. Uh, <laughs> the Band's Visit is a musical about a group of Egyptian uh, police orchestra members who end up in Israel. And there is a mix-up at the border, and my character is responsible for it. And instead of going to the correct town uh, that we are supposed to go to, we go to a wrong town in the desert. Uh, and there are no buses in sight. And so we end up getting taken in by the locals. And unexpected, soulful connections happen as a result of that. The whole play, take, the whole musical takes place over the course of one night and yeah. lives are changed on both right. sides. Um, I've seen it twice already and it's still in previews. It's hard to put into words how beautiful and how different this musical is. Uh, it's short, it's 90 minutes, no intermission. Um, it comes out as a viewer, as an audience member, it feels like life has changed for me as well. Uh, your character, Khaled, does have that moment where he accidentally sends the, the, the band to the wrong town. Um, he is maybe a little distracted by the ladies. He's a womanizer. A little bit, just a little bit. A little Tell bit. us about Khaled and how you understand him. It's a good question. Well, so initially I played him sort of similar to me, which is, which is I am flirtatious. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm fun, I'm confident, and so sort of those are sort of some of the sort of external elements of Khaled, and um, I actually auditioned for the role seven times. I heard that over a couple of years, nine over, months Over nine months, yeah. over nine months, and um, I learned a lot about the character over those nine months because initially I sort of played him very similar to me, sort of external, and, but in order to really compete at this level, you gotta sort of go deeper, and there's a huge turning point where we realize that this guy who's in love with Chet Baker, mm -hmm. who's in love with jazz music, um, who is uh, in love with love, and, and the poet Rumi, as a matter of fact, is actually a really soulful guy. And, and so initially what we think of as kind of this arrogant, flirtatious, sort of one-dimensional character by the end of the play turns into this extremely substantive, soulful, loving, helpful, empathetic person. Um, and, and uh, David Cromer, David Yazbek, and Itamar Moses, uh, playwright, composer, and director, um, were extremely helpful to me in sort of cracking that open because it's, it's vulnerable as a young actor to go there. But, mm -hmm. but to really be selfless and to really be empathetic um, is, is what was expected of me and I think was the final thing that I needed to understand in order to ultimately get the character and get the role. You have, uh, you have embodied this character so beautifully. Uh, one thing about the two cultures represented in this show is that um, English is nobody's first language, but it is, I would say, one of two common languages between the two cultures, the other being music. Right, um, You Good speak point. with uh, uh, 
pretty severe dialect, right. as, as does almost everyone in the right. show. Uh, and I understand that there's a member of your company who's actually from Alexandria, the, the Egyptian yes, town, yes. and that you got yes. some dialect coaching. Osama, Osama Farouk, uh, uh, he is so amazing. So, so when we did the show at the Atlantic, we had seven musicians. And then by the time we went to Broadway, we had eight. Um, and this guy is maybe the most gifted uh, person I've ever seen as an artist. I mean, the way his hands move on the drum is amazing. You've seen it. You've I witnessed have, it. Yeah. Hopefully you guys get a chance too soon. Um, and, 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 and we had a terrific uh, dialect coach. Uh, Muna Ramiki is her name. And, and she's wonderful. She's from Morocco. And she really helped us off Broadway. But I have always um, found my way in through mimicry. Mm. Uh, and through sort of hearing things in, in sort of a tonal sound that aligns with my own sort of vocal register. And so when this guy came in, it was in addition to all the help that Muna gave us as a dialect coach, I was able to sort of soak in the mannerisms, the sound, the tone, the attitude, the hand movements, the body movements. And so I would say the first day that he showed up, I sort of gave him a hug and sort of traded lunch with him for just him to sit down with me and give me all the swagger that the Egyptian guys have. <laughs> yeah. So can you, for people who have not seen you on stage, can mm -hmm. you give them a couple of sentences in your, in your Khaled accent? Absolutely. Like so uh, should I give them the famous one? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, if you so, feel comfortable giving that so, away. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's famous. <laughs> Hopefully I, I make a shirt of it. So, so <laughs> I go up to girls and I, and I ask them, uh, do you like shit baker? Uh, which is one of my favorite lines. Um, and uh, what else do I say? You oh. say... Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, the other one, which I'll tell to you because oh, it's actually oh my gosh. true. He's, he is such uh, a flirt. You have a beautiful eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, okay, yeah. interview over. Bye. We're okay. going... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, th those, you say those lines very early on in the show, and mm -hmm. I remember the first time I saw it being like, oh, this guy... Right. He thinks he's so smooth and he's just like hitting on the girls all the time. And then you have a scene in a roller rink where you sing maybe the most beautiful song I've ever seen on any stage anywhere. Thank you. And I'm like, oh, this guy. <laughs> you know, like I think everyone in the theater falls in love with you in that moment. Um, can you talk about the, the, the line? I think it's the first line of the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The song, not the one about break the ice. the ice, you melt the ice. God, it's something that I need to learn. I'm, I'm singing <laughs> it. I'm teaching it to someone. Um... It's it's one of my favorite um, lines in the play. I, I wrote that on the the on like the playbill. That is my favorite. My actual favorite is who is this man? What is he thinking? Mm. That's actually my favorite, but that's not the question. You you're asked. you're uh, wing manning in this situation. You're teaching oh, right. a young so, so Israeli. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching this young Israeli kid um, who's sort of paranoid and freaked out about um, approaching women. A different way to think about it. And the line he has in his song is tell me I should break the ice. And the only thing that I can think of, which is this wonderful play on words that David Yazbek came up with, which is not break the ice, you melt the ice. Um, no jagged edges. No jagged, no edge, no edge, no walls, no border, which I think is like emblematic of the way we need to think about life in general. I mean, what better philosophy? I mean, we can't control things. We cannot break, I mean, we try to, but things just happen. So we wake up with a plan I woke up on my first audition thinking it was going to be my role. It wasn't. You know what I mean? And I sort of melted into it via life and life experience and time and, and, and sadness and effort and anxiety. And, um, and so, so that has become a personal mantra for me, which is just think of life in this way. Just melt it. Mm -hmm. You cannot break it. We, can't, we don't have as much control. And, and another line in the song is, you see the algebra that moves your knees is, you see the wind that moves the trees is the algebra that moves your knees is written in her eyes. I mean, really poetic, really hard stuff to even make sense of and really hard to even sing in one breath. Uh, <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's really poetic stuff that, that, that you know, and Yazbek spoke about it. It's stuff that speaks to him on a personal level and you feel it as the artist when you sing it and when I get to interpret it. There is poetry in the lyrics of this show and in the staging of the show and in yeah. the performances like yeah. I've never seen on a Broadway show. Yeah. I, I brought my parents who were in town yeah. uh, to see the show and I was trying to explain beforehand to my mom what it was and I said it's kind of an anti-blockbuster. You know, it's like if you are like, oh, people are raving about this Broadway show and they're expecting to see glitter and song and dance right. and these big numbers, it's like understated, poetic, subtle, 
And it still, it manages to take tiny things and make them the most important things in the world. And it's such a great reminder of the beauty in an everyday moment. Right. And, and it's interesting you should mention that because myself and Katrina and Georgia Bood and uh, the creative team all actually traveled this summer to Israel, um, to the town where the film was shot. And we got to hang out with these people. And you're talking about sort of subtle everyday life things. I mean, this is the life of, I think, 99% of people on the planet. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, there's really bad things happening. Um, but there's a lot of really just peaceful people who are content with what they're doing. They wake up, they live their day to day. And we pay homage to that. And, and, and you know, what I think is special about the show is that when I'm on stage, it's this big Broadway stage. It, it's my Broadway debut. It, I makes, know. Me, it makes me nervous. <laughs> um, but I also get to sort of sit back and think about the fact that I'm telling this story about a group of, of, of Israeli people that I had the privilege of meeting this summer. Um, and and who are just lovely, soulful, every day, work from day to the day um, people, and, and we get to pay homage to that. And so it's not about the glitter or the glam. Um, no, there's sorry, no it's hot in this jacket. I'm about to take it off. Yeah, do it. Make yourself <laughs> comfortable. Sure. Yeah, this, a couple of the moments that I love the most in in the show aren't even the sort of step forward and have your moment in the spotlight. It's like. There's a moment where you take a bite of a piece of watermelon, and it's like, right. wow, who knew that a bite of watermelon could be so beautiful? Right. Or the idea of a guy who spends his entire night um, uh, waiting for a phone call, right. or imagining what a park would look like in the middle of the desert. Right. And it's like, it's like a breath. It's like, ah, I can't explain it, you guys. You have to go see, see it. it. Gotta but see also, it. I, I, it's worth mentioning, the cast album has been recorded. No, no, no. It's going to be recorded on Monday. Oh, because I saw a video of you singing. That was the demo recording. Oh. And we're doing another recording this Monday. Wow. So in two days, you have your opening night. In two and days, we have our opening night. And a few days after that, you're we're recording the album. We're going to drink for the first time in two months because ah. we can't drink because we're doing a show and rehearsing 16 hours a day. Are you still uh, rehearsing? Today's the first day we're not, but I'm rehearsing with you. High five. <laughs> <laughs> I, one of the things I love, you mentioned that it's your Broadway debut, mm -hmm. and I have gotten to know you enough through your social media to know that you are a huge theater fan mm -hmm. and that you are unabashedly pinching yourself about this experience. Mm -hmm. I also know that you had an experience as an audience member going to see In the Heights that changed yes. your life. Can yes. you talk about that? Yes, I can, and it's kind of crazy because... I'm right down the street where I went to school. I went to school like, what, 200 meters away <laughs> from here. So it's actually surreal. I came here at 17 to visit um, NYU and to visit a few other college programs. And the show that I needed to see was In the Heights because that was the show that, if I'm going to be frank with you, at that time felt like the only reality for me in the musical theater. Um, I am a Middle Eastern American. Um, and at that time, uh, I felt like the only roles I might be able to play were Latino or biracial, African-American, half white, half black. Um, and actually makes me sort of uncomfortable talking about it. But um, so in any case, that was extremely impactful for me. And I went to the show and I met Chris Jackson, who I love, who I know has been a Build uh, member in the past. And he brought me backstage. He met me at the stage door, and I was like, bro, I love your show. You're so amazing. Talk to me. Tell me everything about life. And, and at the end of him signing autographs, he came back to me. He's like, hey, man, come backstage with me. And you had not met him at this point. No. He just saw no, you No, he's just said... an extremely soulful guy. Yeah. And he brought me backstage. We went onto the orchestra. We looked up at the mezzanine. And he said, look, man, just the mezzanine. It just has a little more seats. Learn how to tell a story. But I know you're going to get here. That's what he told me. And it like shocked me. And, and, and I know you didn't ask this, but I kind of felt like I believe that in the abstract, but I'm a Middle Eastern dude and I don't see stories written for me right now. So I don't really believe you. Like I, I kind of believe you. Um, but it, it also felt like it wasn't a reality. Um, and even through college studying at NYU, I was doing monologues. Um, from from African American playwrights, from Latino playwrights, from playwrights that had nothing to do with my background or my my history, or my lineage. Um, so it was wonderful to have a mentor. Um, it's even more wonderful now to be able to represent my culture on stage. 
Will you talk about your Facebook profile photo? Yeah, please, please. I would love to. Um, so I, I, I think it was like a two two weeks into previews in this in this lovely sort of energetic Lebanese uh, Palestinian American woman sort of ran past the gates at the stage door and came up to me and was kind of like. She just, she just, she had no words. She just was so grateful for what she had seen. Um, and and I wish I could have been able to do that. I, I was never able to do that, but she was so grateful and felt that she had been represented. She'd felt like she'd been um, represented on stage for the first time. And, and so I responded to that and I said, listen, if there are Middle Eastern kids watching, if there's any Middle Eastern kids here, if there are Middle Eastern kids who are gonna watch this, DM me, I will buy you a ticket you please come to our show. Um, it's something, it, it, is, it is crazy. And, and I should mention also that yesterday we received this booklet from this lovely young um, Israeli girl who sent us a booklet of handwritten notes from fans who were like, I can't believe we're being represented. This means so much to us from Israel. Wow. And we have people from Lebanon, we have people from the Middle East um, it's make, it's giving me goosebumps right now talking about it. Um, and, and so this has been transformative to me, uh, more so on a personal and cultural moment than it is on a professional moment, even though the professional moment is obviously very exciting. Yeah. Ugh. I want to buy everyone a ticket to this show too. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I stand by it. I will host any Middle Eastern kid who like wants to do the arts. You will have a backstage tour and you will have a ticket from me. Obviously, I'm speechless. It doesn't happen that often, but I'm yeah. so moved by this story. I also, there's also just such a neat social media element of that because didn't you, like you didn't have a photo of that moment and you were like, I wish I had a photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. This is the funniest part. The person who posted it only wrote, I, I think, I apologize if I'm not being accurate, I think only in Chinese. Um, and then there was a hashtag that said Ariel Stachel. And <laughs> I just decided to look at this hashtag and then I found this picture of this girl because I had tweeted about it prior and said, I wish I had a picture to tell the story. And I found it. And yeah, social media is, is awesome. And, you know, I don't even know. I mean, speaking of Chris Jackson, to circle it back, I don't even know that there was Instagram or Twitter to connect in that way at that time. Twitter was just starting. Was just, I, don't I don't think, think Instagram, Instagram was, existed. and that, like they weren't going to accept my MySpace friend request. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, Did you and Chris take a picture uh, that day when you went backstage? In my brain, but just not in not brain. in person. I didn't have an iPhone then. I think I had like a. Y'all know the phones we used to have. I don't know what it the was. Razor. I didn't the know. Razor. I didn't have it. Was worse. The Razor was with the cool kids. <laughs> the I little had Nokia like brick. The one where like A, B, C, D. Yeah, for texting. Then I had to redo it because I went to the D and now I wanted to get to the B, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of phone that I had. Oh, um, man. Oh, you know what else is funny is I, I like to do a lot of research, dig okay. back through like Google News Alerts with people's names and stuff. Playbill did a feature on you that was like, mm -hmm, man mm -hmm, on the street, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a struggling actor going to four auditions today. You were interviewed by Playbill as a civilian that like was a week before I booked the man's visit ago. that was a week before I, I booked the man's visit that was a week before um, uh, a week before I booked the man's visit I had like four auditions and I bumped into the Playbill people and they were just talking about me and I talked about Middle Eastern representation and then and then I think I think that was August of something and then August I will never forget the date August 13th uh, 2016 August 14th at 1 a.m., I got a text from an agent that I got the band's visit, and I cried, and I drank half a bottle of whiskey on the street, and just like... <laughs> on the street? Um, freaked out, because, I, because I, knew, I knew it was the job that I needed to get, yeah. and, and, and I actually went into a deep depression when I didn't get it earlier, mm. because I knew that this was my role. Did somebody else... Was somebody else playing it, or they just hadn't decided Somebody yet? else got it, and really? somebody else got a different job, and I replaced him. I was the second-to-last person to join Off-Broadway. Listen, it's tough, and here's the thing. Without a lot of options for Middle Eastern people to play roles in on theater, in the stage, in the media, um, I I couldn't compete with my resume, and so by the point where the other guy got another job, I kind of came in and and had to convince. This is people are spending money; they need to trust you. So it's not good enough if I do a good audition. You need a resume, mm -hmm. and so we're changing that. We're changing that. Isn't that cool? You got a resume. Isn't that cool. We're changing that. We're changing that. Yeah. I can't imagine anybody but you playing this role. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, the the I would say the two quote unquote leads of the show, Katrina Link and Tony Shalhoub, are so fantastic. You steal that show, man. That um, <sighs> how do I answer that? It's not even a question; it's a statement. I'll say thank you, uh, and I'll. And that's not to I'll, take anything no, away from no, them. No, no, it's not to take anything away from them. Listen, you know, and and I got to give credit to my buddy Itai Benson, who's my best friend, and and also had a, sort of this long journey of getting to the show, and and you know, when I look out on that stage, I I, I see images of my grandfather immigrating from Yemen to Israel. I mean. You know, I mean, there's the technique and then there's like the soul when it comes to acting. Like the technique is really important and I studied for 10 years and I will continue to train technically as an actor. But when it speaks to your soul, when I can feel my grandfather who memorized the Torah, who, who picked up his family and lived in a hut so that he could practice Judaism in Israel because he was kicked off of the sidewalk in Yemen. When I get to tell that story, yeah, it, it, that's what it means to me. So. I think that's what you're picking up on. Um, but also the ensemble is so strong that I oh. think that we, I, the ensemble is so strong. We get to play off of each other so much that like everyone's doing good stuff. And, and, and I get to like Tony Shalhoub I know. is like, he, like it started as like, he was my mentor, but, but now he's like a colleague and that doesn't make sense to me. And I'm still like, <laughs> again, because like I'm freaking out because again, like seven years ago, I didn't believe that this could be a reality. And, and I still, again, don't feel a hundred percent like it is a reality. I'm still, there's a contradiction between who I am, Ariel Stachel, the kid who was embarrassed by his father being Yemenite and speaking Hebrew and like eating these weird foods and then going to school and like trying to fit in like it, it's still weird We're gonna take uh, some questions from the audience But first I want to address a story that I absolutely love that I read in an interview get you gave about how um, A piece of art has the power to cross over and change people you have a grandparent who is suddenly like who's a total intellectual Stanford professor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who now loves rap music right because of how he was exposed right to yeah him. Yeah, my 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 mom's uh, my mom my parents are divorced and my mom remarried and 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 that side of the family is all intellectuals and they're big time psychologists and my uncle is actually a psychologist over at NYU, oh. Josh Aronson, shout out, <laughs> uh, he's a, such a great guy. He's gonna come to the show this weekend. Um, it yeah, Broadway has this cross cutting appeal and so it's in this medium that a particular demographic often goes to see and then. Hamilton, let's introduce rap to them. Well, the band's visit, let's introduce an oud and a darbuka to them. Is what does that do? Is this one of those? That's one of those things. So this so necklace is they sell. We're such the fan, we're such fans of Laura Haywood at the band's visit that we gave her <laughs> the producer Orrin Wolf gifted her this, and that's a, a picture of an oud, which is um, an Arabic instrument that most resembles a guitar, but makes a very different sound and, and you guys should get into it and, and if you listen to our cast album uh you'll you'll see some of it there's so much of the music that feels familiar yeah. even while feeling mind expanding yeah and i cannot wait for that album to come out yeah so you rest that voice i will after this because <laughs> <laughs> we need it perfect on that yeah on that cast album i don't have any doubts let's take a couple of questions Hi, hey oh there. my gosh, your story is so incredible. Thank and you. I saw you perform at Elsie Fest. Oh, thank you. So I'm really excited to see this show at the end of the month. Um, so this is your Broadway debut. Mm -hmm. What has been the most exciting part of the process up till now? I mean, first of all, things like, like people are like sitting here looking at me, listening to me talk, like <laughs> that never happened. So, <laughs> so that's kind of cool. People care about what I have to say, or at least you guys pretend like it really well. Um, uh, 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 I would, I, I mean, you know, standing on that stage and looking and there being a mezzanine and sort of being able to have this impact, but I'll, I'll really go back and say that it's these relationships with these kids. It's, it's having that relationship. It's this beautiful, it's the, it's the best form of social media. It's, it's being able to connect with people, uplift them, offer higher visibility. Um, and then, you know, the personal stuff of just being on Broadway, which is cool. It's fun. <laughs> it's, I've worked really, really hard for it. So. You earned it. Thank you. I feel proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> like, Thank you. Thank you. I think part of that's we're from the same hometown. So I'm like, that's right. that's I'm right. like, you did it. My yeah. hometown boy. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but also I always just appreciate so much when somebody doesn't expect something to fall in their lap and then they get it because right. they 
refuse to stop until they do. Right. Do we have another question? Hi. Hey. Um, I wanted to know what was the moment that you knew you wanted to go into acting, particularly stage, and did you have to struggle to convince family and friends to let you choose this path as a career? It's a wonderful question. Um, so, so I grew up uh, in the Bay Area where, where Laura did, um, and I wanted to be a basketball player. And um, in ninth grade, I made the basketball team, and I had a teammate who was six foot eight and who was dunking. And I was like, this is not going to happen. <laughs> uh, this is not going to happen for me. And so I joined the musical and had a great time. And What then, musical was it? Uh, uh, my first musical was Bad Boy. <laughs> Bad Boy? And I, I, I played some queen in the background. I don't I don't even I don't even know what I did, but but it's an underrated show. Yeah, no, it's, a good, it's, a, it's good a good show. Good but show. at that point I couldn't even I mean my audition for that I sang Happy Birthday a cappella and I sang <laughs> it to like a pear. I'm not kidding. That a, was my a first audition. Piece of fruit? A piece of fruit. A pear. <laughs> uh and and then I switched to um to an arts high school and studied dance and I wasn't very good. I wasn't very good. But by the end of my sophomore year I was competing and I was in Footloose and I almost got Ren, but I played Willard. I don't know if you know the show. And at that point I was like, I'm gonna do musical theater for the rest of my life. And I think you asked another question that I didn't ask, but did I have any pushback from my family? No, my family was extremely supportive. Um, the role that made me feel like I could do musical theater as a living was playing Tevya and Fiddler on the Roof when I was 17. And that, and that remains my favorite, that, the band's video is my favorite musical, but Fiddler on the Roof is my favorite musical. Ariel um, made maybe the mistake of adding me as a friend on Facebook, so I went back and read everything anyone's ever written on your right, wall. Right. And one of them is like, you're the greatest Tevi I've ever seen. <laughs> I think it was from one of your teachers. Oh, goodness. And, and there was another p comment from your teacher that said, you were, a, you were difficult sometimes, but my most difficult students are the ones that I remember the best. Yes, I mean, I, I was one of those kids who had, um, you know, like incentive stickers on my desk, so like... If I behaved and I didn't get, and if I got enough stickers in a day, then I'd get like a treat at the end. Like I was always in trouble. I was always in like, <laughs> in detention. Not because I was bad, because I was like excited. And if like I thought something was like great or I had the answer, like I couldn't raise my hand. I would just like jump in front of the <laughs> class and just like be crazy. Um, so now I get to do it in a structured way, and I'm sure my teachers are more happy with that now. <laughs> Everyone's proud of you. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Hi, how are you? Hey. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about how this role required intense vulnerability. Um, did you find that that was hard to access, just because I'm sure the show was very emotional for you, and is it easier to access now? It's a great question. Um, I, I think doing doing the work that we do comes at a cost, um, and, and, and some of the techniques that I've studied have involved really painful things to think about um, in order to sort of give the performance. And, and at a certain point, you sort of learn how to sort of detach from these very personal things in your life um, after you do them, but you do have to go there. And so um, it, it is a little painful, but also extremely exciting. And when you do it right, you don't want to do it any other way. Um, and, and one of the techniques that I learned, and I have to shout out, I had, I had an acting teacher after college named Andrew Stewart Jones, who taught uh, the crack hour technique. And he really changed my life because he says all your work needs to be extremely personal and it also has to all be about the other person. And so when I first was singing Khaled's song, which you guys may all hear if you see the show, it was um, kind of a, like this performance, this jazzy song. The more I make it about the other person and the more I really personalize, the more satisfying it is for me. So it is easier to go there and it comes at a somewhat of a cost. Um, but a cost, like, like this is what I chose to do for a living and I'm blessed to do it for a living, so I wouldn't have it any other way. Well said. There's a line in the show that I'm sure I'm gonna butcher, but I think it encompasses my entire feeling about, about the band's visit and that is, Nothing is more beautiful than something you didn't expect. One of my favorite lines in the show. Yeah. And this is a completely unexpected, completely different, absolutely necessary, gorgeous work of the American theater. And it gets my highest recommendation. Thank you. Bring everyone you know to see it. 
and then get tickets to see it again. Thank you so much thank for you. being here thank today. Thank you, thank you, thank you.